So our next two speakers were, you know, this is really a great lineup uh, this year. And I'm really excited to introduce uh, two gentlemen who I know uh, very well, uh, for better or for worse. Derek probably wishes that I, I didn't know him as well. Uh, but it is our uh, city's preservation uh, manager, Derek Kilborn. Uh, and just so that, that you're aware, again, uh, Preserve the Berg, you know, doing that, that advocacy work. Uh, we're meeting regularly with our city officials, uh, including Derek's office and... Um, and, and we're very appreciative of, of that time and, and that space that he gives us to, uh, uh, you know, encourage uh, a strengthened preservation, <laughs> preservation in St. Petersburg. So uh, uh, Derek Kilborn and then also Bob Mayer, who we have worked with on a variety of projects from uh, MR Capital Advisors. And both of these gentlemen are going to talk about um, preservation incentives that are available here in St. Petersburg, but I also know that Bob is going to talk about, um, or present some case studies of uh, some preservation work that he has done in, in other places and really show uh, the value uh, of these kinds of things. And all we have to do is get that state level incentive passed and then, you know, it's off to the races. So we're gonna bring up um, Derek first. So welcome Derek. Right, thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. As you heard, uh, Derek Kilborn, I manage the City of St. Petersburg's Urban Planning and Historic Preservation Division. I, uh, before I begin, there were a couple of just quick points I wanted to make. I know many of you were listening to the presentation earlier. Alex Smith did an excellent job introducing accessory dwelling units. Um, what he did not know is we have rolled out a new website that has a much shorter web address than the one he was showing on his slide. So very simply, it is stpete.org forward slash, and then the initials ADU. So stpete.org forward slash ADU. Uh, the other thing I wanna do before I begin talking about the incentives is in St. Petersburg, we have uh, an uh, a city committee called the Community Planning and Preservation Commission. Yeah. And I know that in the audience today, we have several members from that commission that are here. We have, I see Ashley Marbe is here. We have Cassie Gardner in the back. We also have Bob Jeffrey who's here. And I understand uh, Will Michaels is here today too. So I want to publicly thank them for their service and volunteering on that commission. It's very important to the work that we do at the city. Uh, but it's also very important in helping the residents uh, advance the goal of historic preservation. So what I've been asked to talk to you about today are incentives. So I'm going to try to walk through those on just a very high level introduction. And then uh, Mr. Mayor, he's gonna go through some projects that he has worked on and talk to you in a little more detail and depth about how to actually apply some of these incentives in a real world example. Uh, Mr. Lito, when he introduced me, he referenced incentives in the city of St. Petersburg, but I know that not everybody here today is from St. Petersburg, so I intentionally chose this cover photo, which is mailbox 727 from the city's open air post office to show that what I'm going to talk about in some instances are specific to St. Pete, but uh, hopefully our examples to everybody else throughout the community, um, and they can see how those might be applied in their community as well. You know, one of the goals that we try to remind ourselves in our office is that the goal of historic preservation is to give owners the tools um, and help assist them in making decisions to preserve their historic buildings. And oftentimes, uh, people immediately jump into uh, a conversation, sometimes a debate, about designation. But at the end of the day, outside of designation, the goal is to maintain and preserve older and historic buildings. Now, we have a, a much finer set of uh, districts in the city that we focus on, but some of the incentives that we will talk about today are not required to be within one of these districts. These are things that people can sometimes take advantage of without a designation in place. Um, what I want to show you here, this is the local historic district map for the city of St. Petersburg. 
we have 10 local historic districts. Uh, you heard and see, saw a map earlier today about the Kenwood neighborhood, uh, which is over here on the left side. And then you have some smaller districts over here on the east side. We have a much larger footprint of national registered districts. And when we get to a discussion about the ad valorem tax exemption, it's important to remember the scale of this map. Uh, oftentimes when we're talking to residents, uh, they know that they are not in a local historic district, but they are unaware that they are in a national registered district. And by being in a national registered district, they already qualify for an ad valorem tax exemption on improvements that they are making to their building and property. So this is one of those examples where it's important to know where you are in the city or the county, uh, what designations might be in place, and whether the, these different incentives apply. Uh, finally, for the city, we do have this resource, stp.org forward slash in the word history. You can use that website to click into an interactive map. And using that interactive map, you can access your parcel and identify whether you're in a local district, a national registered district. Uh, we also have some fun information layers on there too. For example, historic trolley lines. Those have nothing to do with incentives like we're talking about now, but they are fun things to kind of click through as well. Okay, incentives. Um, I mentioned you don't always have to be in a district. And this is really important when you think about at least our division and our staff at the city. We provide courtesy feedback. We will do courtesy review of certain design decisions that you are uh, thinking about making on your property. Um, again, you don't have to be in a district. If you own an older home, we will help walk you through. Uh, in this picture here, you'll see the St. Petersburg design guidelines. We'll uh, show you the information that's in there. We'll help you interpret that information and help you make some decisions that are historically appropriate for your building. Uh, we have even gone so far as having staff come out to a piece of property. We've had owners contact our office and say, hey, I have a window contractor that's going to be coming out to my house. I'm a little concerned. I might be getting uh, bias information from the contractor. Is there somebody who can also come for that appointment and just hear the information and give me a different perspective from the historic preservation side? Our staff has done that. Uh, we will continue to do that. As time permits, we'll have somebody come out and provide that service. So the first incentive is courtesy assistance, simply asking for help because we can oftentimes provide that. The second thing is a local ad valorem tax exemption. I showed you the map of the National Register districts. Oftentimes within those districts, Individuals are making substantial improvements to their property. And the way the local ad valorem tax exemption program works is you can capture the value from those qualified improvements and have those returned as a rebate on your property taxes for a 10 year period going forwards. That process does require you to file an application at the beginning and it requires you to file uh, what we call a part two application at the end. And the reason that you have that application at the beginning and the end is an attempt to certify, not only for the city, but more importantly for the Pinellas County Property Appraiser's Office, the values that are the, I'm sorry, the improvements that have been made and the value that is derived from those improvements. So this is something that I think is often overlooked particularly when you see the amount of investment and improvements that have been made within the National Register districts, there is, in my opinion, a lot of money that is left on the table um, that could have been captured by simply filling out a form at the beginning and a form at the end of the process. 
You do not have to be a local historic district or an individual local landmark to use this program. The second thing is a federal rehabilitation tax credit. Uh, what you are going to hear, I think, is more details uh, potentially about that program in the examples. And similar to our local ad valorem tax exemption, this is an incentive that applies to national registered properties that are income generating properties. And so to use these, we would be a local liaison for you, but we would then uh, partner you and connect you with our state historic preservation office, and you would go through the project in coordination with them. This uh, we, is something that we haven't seen often in St. Petersburg. We don't have a lot of local professionals that know how to navigate the federal tax credit, uh, but we do have some examples, and this is a very familiar building to everyone uh, located in our downtown that did take advantage of that federal tax program. The next incentive we have in our code is adaptive reuse. Oftentimes, the historic buildings are located in neighborhoods um, where they have become uh, non-conforming over time. They no longer comply with the code regulations. Again, going back to that accessory dwelling unit presentation that you heard earlier today, it was remarked that there's often density in these older historic neighborhoods or accessory buildings that don't comply with today's development standards. So similarly, we have these buildings. Oftentimes, they're institutional buildings like schools or churches. They're in single-family zone neighborhoods. Those congregations and schools close, but the scale of the building is really too large to be converted to a single-family house. So in St. Petersburg and in other communities, they have adaptive reuse uh, flexibility, which allows the city to consider other uses that might otherwise be prohibited by the zoning category. Uh, we have made some very effective use of adaptive reuse in the city of St. Petersburg. It's primarily been applied to retired school buildings and churches, but if you're following along, uh, we had a very timely application just last night with city council where this particular building here, which was a former standard oil filling station, uh, went through a series of steps and has now been approved for local landmark designation in order to use the adaptive reuse incentive so that they can convert this building to a small neighborhood scaled uh, cafe with a drive-through service window um, out that side window on the left. And so this is an example of how the adaptive reuse process can be utilized to help save a very important and uh, iconic building to uh, not only the city of St. Petersburg, but really our, our early uh, automobile history. Floor area ratio exemptions. Uh, floor area ratio is describing how much square feet can go into a particular building on a particular piece of land. Um, in the city of St. Petersburg, in the downtown center zoning categories, we exempt the square footage that is in historic buildings that are designated local landmarks from the overall floor area ratio calculation. And that is an important incentive because what we are trying to do is show that if new development is going to occur on a portion of a parcel, that they should consider retaining the existing historic building on the site because that square footage will not count against them in the new construction. It's exempt. So one of the things that um, has amused me over the years, unfortunately, um, it had a demolition outcome, but this example is something that some of us here had referred to for many years as the cheese grater building at 4th Street and Central Avenue. It had a metal screen around the outside. Prior to that metal screen being applied, this is what the buildings looked like on that street corner. There was uh, an effort to redevelop the block, and there was a campaign uh, arguing that the building should be demolished so that they aren't in the way of new construction. 
And um, the, the thing that was amusing to me was that these particular buildings were exempt from any square foot calculation on that block. So my counterpoint to that at that time was, why stand in the way of having all the new construction you're asking for, but including these two historic buildings um, that don't count against their new square footage? So exempting floor area ratio, in this case, at the end, it did not work, but this can be an effective tool to incentivize preserving a building. We also have transfer of development rights. Uh, oftentimes, historic buildings might be much smaller than the development entitlement for a piece of property. And so the value of redevelopment can far exceed the value of preserving a building. And that would push somebody into a demolition redevelopment scenario. So what some communities try to do is monetize the undeveloped square footage into what we call a transfer of development right so that that credit can then be sold and transferred to another piece of property and it gives value to that historic building and helps it compete on a more even plane with a redevelopment decision. Uh, the transfer of development rights program in St. Petersburg was stagnant for a very long time. In the last few years, we've made a number of changes to that program and it has become very activated so much so that we have owners of historic buildings now uh, inquiring about creating TDR credits so that they can also participate in that market and transfer or sell the credits that they have. This is the uh, Mirror Lake School or Mirror Lake Condos today. This was a former school building and it's on the North Shore of Mirror Lake. They have just completed going through the process of creating TDR credits. So on the screen, you can see that they have uh, of unde undeveloped potential 138,955 square feet. In this scenario, they're able to take that square footage, convert it to uh, TDR credits, and then sell those TDR credits. Now they have created the credits, they have not sold them yet, but uh, the feedback that we are receiving as staff is that these TDR credits are currently selling on the market between $15 and $25 per credit. So just running through that scenario, you can see that the value of those TDR credits could potentially extend from 2.1 million to 3.5 million. So the TDR program, again, can be very helpful in creating uh, value to preserving a historic building. Historic signs. Uh, we have a number of historic signs in the city. There has been much more interest generated in neon signs, roadside Americana. Um, and so the city started looking at uh, opportunities to create incentives for preserving historic signs. Oftentimes they have neon, they are at a scale that is too large for what sign ordinances allow today. They might be located too close to the street and don't comply with the setback requirement. Or oftentimes they have animated features that um, are no longer allowed by code. So the city of St. Petersburg has a historic sign carve out and there are exemptions in that sign ordinance that are attempting to accommodate these types of historic signs. We have a book that's available through the website that you can access and flip through, describing that program, describing the history of signage in the city, and it also includes a list of qualified signs and just an appendix of signs that no longer exist, but as we discovered them in research, we thought that that would be a nice reference tool as well. But historic signs is another way for communities to save iconic uh, symbols, not necessarily buildings, that are just as important to placemaking and defining character for an area as the buildings it themselves. Okay, Florida Building Code exemptions. When buildings are historic, there are some Florida Building Code exemptions that uh, we can 
uh, coordinate through our office with the building official. So we have had a number of instances where um, somebody has come in and there are improvements that they are required to make to their building because they no longer comply with the Florida Building Code. If that building has a historic status, there is flexibility that we can try to negotiate um, to uh, make sure that that improvement is not necessarily required in the way that it might be for a new building or a building that does not have that same historic status. So that could come with significant savings depending on what uh, that property owner is being told they have to come into compliance with. Um, we have had some mixed success with this and sometimes it's not our building construction services and permitting staff, sometimes that crosses over into fire department, fire and life safety issues. Um, we have had much more success on the building side than we have had on the fire side. But again, this is another incentive to consider. Um, if it's not already set up and in place in your local municipality, this is something that can be incorporated into the regulating documents to give the authority for that municipality to do that. There are a number of grant programs out there. Uh, first, we have a program in the city that was initially designed in 2018 for the in-town redevelopment plan area. This was initially a $5 million program that was created. And the intention for that program was to have a uh, competitive grant process that would award up to $1 million per year over a five-year period. And the purpose of this grant was to uh, encourage property owners to either designate their building to get access to the grant program, or if they were already designated, to apply and make building improvements that would contribute to the long-term durability of that building. The program in the first year, uh, you can see we had selected five awardees and they in total received $808,787. So we had a very productive first year and then we were into the COVID uh, cycle and many of these grant programs were put on pause. Right now, this program for us is on pause and we are working to try to get this reactivated. But uh, again, I included it in the presentation today so that you can see some of the different tools that are out there. One thing I didn't include in this presentation but is similar to historic signs is the city has started identifying and talking about what are called legacy businesses. So these are oftentimes uh, small businesses, family owned, that have been in the community for a very long period of time. For us, we're typically talking about 50 years or more. Um, with these uh, businesses, when they are applying, for example, through the historic grant program, they are receiving additional bonus points in their scoring uh, because now we are not only contributing to building improvements, but we are also assisting one of these legacy businesses that has contributed to the community and really define uh, kind of the place that we, and the pride of place that we have built here. There are also state and federal level grant programs for us, we have uh, utilized several of those. One of them is a special category grant, uh, which annually awards up to $500,000. Uh, Sunken Gardens has been able to take advantage of this grant program for a number of the improvements that they are making at that facility. And then there are also small matching grants up to $50,000. Here in the city of St. Petersburg, we were able to use that small matching grant to establish the uh, city's African American Heritage Trail, which has been a very successful tool for heritage tourism. Um, you know, the buildings are important, but also building the culture and the interest in those buildings and places is uh, very important as well. And so the Heritage Trail is, has really contributed to um, our ability to do that in the places where we are trying to protect and preserve these buildings. There are also conservation and preservation easements 
that can be applied in different ways. Uh, for us here in the city of St. Petersburg, the Snell Arcade building has a conservation uh, easement that is applied to the facade of the building and is held uh, by the state's Florida Trust program, uh, the, the Florida Trust program in the state of Florida. And uh, this is the Snell Arcade building if you're unfamiliar with that, but that facade easement had uh, brought some incentive to the property owner for doing that, but for the community, it's also guaranteeing a long-term protection on the exterior facade of that building. Um, I've itemized some other it's on the uh, bottom left here in the list. Uh, I'm not gonna go through those in the presentation. We do have a handout at the table and we have a handout on our website that goes through in just a little bit more detail all of the things that we've covered today and also includes a number of links um, to access you to that information. And with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to you. Uh, Bob Mayer who's gonna talk about several examples. Thank you. So now you all got those down, all those incentives memorized, everybody. Um, I'm gonna kind of take, I, the reason I asked Derek, he did a great job of saying what's available, but I'm from, originally from Missouri, it's a show me state, and so you gotta show me what that means. You know, development's not for everybody, but I'll tell you what, historic development is such a great opportunity to preserve the past. When I, years ago, went to the University of Vienna in Austria for a junior year, I was very fortunate to do that, <clears throat> I realized how much preservation was there and how old the history is. And then you, and you go around, the, you know, from Vienna to Czechoslovakia to, to Prague to wherever, and you see that history and you come back to the United States and you realize that in the 50s, you know, we kind of decided to take these old brick buildings and cover them up with vinyl and all this other stuff. And we made it, we thought that was modern. Well, the reality is that now what's old is new. What old is cool. And so what I'm, this is a picture, by the way, of Union Station in Kansas City, Missouri. I split my time between Kansas City and St. Pete. I love both cities. Uh, I think St. Pete is a fantastic place. When I first originally came here, I met Peter Belmont, who was part of the Preserve the Burg. Peter's a great advocate, still around, going to come here soon, I understand. Um, but, you know, it takes a village to grow preservation, and that's what Preserve the Burg has been. I actually got involved in my partner, Caleb Bulin with the Shell Dash Cottage, which some of you probably, how many of you have heard about the Shell Dash Cottage? Yeah, a few of you. It's a fantastic resource that needs to be preserved up on 2nd Street and Martin Luther King. And it was one of the last Coquina, Coquina Key shells uh, fabric. And we were gonna move that and worked with Preserve the Berg back about four years ago to move that from basically that 2nd Street because it's Preserve the Burg, got a grant, still has it, to 16th Street, where the city was willing to donate a site. And we're calling it the Shell Dash Cottages, townhomes. What happened was, which is what happens with a lot of development and real estate, is the developer decided that owned it, that the expiration of what he was gonna donate to Preserve the Burg had expired, and gee, he conveniently had some use for it. Well, here we go two years later, it sits there, it's fenced off, he's working on value, wants to build multifamily. We were gonna move that and put it in our original Shell Dash townhomes, which is on 16th Street. And unfortunately, that didn't happen, it's still sitting there, but we did keep the name alive, Shell Dash Townhomes, and are gonna do those in partnership with Habitat for Humanity to do affordable housing. Now, it's not easy to do this, by the way, because myself and my partner, who is an architect, I'm a developer, we basically are working for free on this. We had Natalie DeVincente, who's out there with Southern Roots, helped us a lot. We had a number of people helping us. The city was great. They gave us over a million one grant, uh, but it had conditions. And we couldn't get a local bank to finance. They said, hey, if you put up the money, we had a million from the city, 
we had already a half a million dollars of what we had invested and they said well if you guys put more money in then we'll loan on the back end and that's not how these partnerships should work and that's why what Melissa was pointing out with Derek why historic tax credit preservation credits on the state level are so critical because I'm going to show you some case studies of three projects in Kansas City that my partner and I have done that made it work but for the use of state credits and federal credits combined. They gave us over 45% of investment that we were allowed to use as equity into the deal. And guess what? When you have that kind of local credits, all of a sudden the banks get interested. There are certain banks in the country like US Bank and Bank of America that will do that, but there's a lot of, in Missouri, as an example, there are a lot of, um, banks and this is uh, i'm going to go through this case study but there's a lot of banks that would not loan on this project initially for a couple reasons it was in a redlined area which is kind of like 22nd street the deuces it's it's our deuces it's 20 it's on truce avenue in kansas city and it, this building is an old wonder bread building that was amazingly historic was functional to about 20 years ago and then shut down and stayed there. So we were able to acquire that building and uh, this is showing kind of an architectural rendering of the deck, but I wanna give you, this is basically what it's called, the Wonder Lofts and Shops Mixed Use Development. So what we did was, we, it's like St. Pete, we completely reconverted it, vacant building and we utilize the building, but the first step we have to do is get it designated as historic. That's what we did. We went through SHPO, through the Department of Natural Resources in Missouri, that takes about a year. Florida, it's not that, it could be a little faster, Melissa, but they tend to move as they move. But it, it was great because it allowed us to basically start developing the thoughts of how we were gonna put this building together, the kinds of tax abatement, submission to the state for state credits finally, and then the federal credits. So this is a project that we started. You can see um, it actually was a Wonder Bread factory, as I said. It originally was constructed in 1909, and see where that Wonder truck is up there? That's a, by the way, that's a, that's a bar. We put it up there, lifted it up, but it's an original Wonder Bread truck to give it kind of, because that's one of the things, as you know, everybody likes to do in development, and we include it, do a skyline. So that's a huge event space up there. And there used to be on this corner up here, a steeple, a historic steeple back in the 1920s. Unfortunately, that went away back in the 50s. And, but we, they did preserve, had presence of mind, even at Wonder Bread, making it to do that entire facade. So what my partner Caleb Mullen and I did was we basically looked at how we would use the lower level, which are retail shops. We have a wonderful restaurant, it's called The Combine. Windows can open up in the summer. Uh, we have, and I'll show you some of the other projects there, but we reconditioned it. And we were able to do 87 apartments, a 45,000 45, uh, square feet of commercial, which includes the roof. And basically, the cost of the project is 18 million. Now, how do we get there? We got there because the federal credits that we submitted were worth 2.4 million. The state credits combined with that were 2.8 million. And we used over, there's another tool that can be used in nationally and in St. Petersburg called new market tax credits. What it does is it allows, it's a federal credit allows in an area where there's blight or where there needs to be, it's a job creation credit. And it allows you, if you're doing retail, in order to basically allow you to um, generate that money, and by the way, have an accountant, a good accountant, and have a good um, CPA tied in with that accountant, and have also a good bank, because you sell those credits, basically. And we combine using those credits to build this all retail section above it. The parts of it, of, uh, in addition, are, well, these are some of the, so we currently now, this is uh, five years later. It's over 90% occupied. By the way, this is in the central inner city, like the Deuces, where they said nobody would come. The beauty is that you have not just African-American people there, but you have white folks there that want to be in a cool, hip place. 
where rents, as I'll break out later, are very affordable because we wanted to get, we involved the city in tax abatement on that project to keep affordability, which is a big topic today for St. Petersburg, for Kansas City, for St. Louis, wherever. It's a major topic. But these are the kinds of spaces that came in there that were kind of cool. We have, <clears throat> we have a home health care, which is basically like a free medical clinic for low-income people. There's a hair collective. There's a bike, you know, you have the free bikes, in K not free, but you charge the bike St. Pete. We have a bike KC, it's in there. Uh, solid State, which is kind of cool. It's old guy, a guy that restores pinballs and brings them back. In other words, we brought local businesses back into that area. We were the first pioneers in terms of taking this area of truce to redevelop it. And uh, as a result of that, this was an example in St. In Kansas City when a delegation from the chamber here in St. Petersburg. I've been coming here and working here for a few years and I was able to work with uh, Nathan Stone, Stone, how does he pronounce his name? Stone Pfeiffer. He's the owner of Green Bench Brewery. Everybody knows Green Bench. Green Bench is one of the partners with uh, Preserve the Bird. So they brought a delegation, included Mayor Kreisman at the time, and basically we were in that building talking about how the rejuvenation of Troost was about saving old historic buildings, not displacing the low-income folks there, but creating new value, new development, and that's what these historic tax credits did. In addition, it allowed then other developers to come in and then spend money up and down that corridor. So it became a whole overlay, like Derek's pointed out, a whole historic slash redevelopment district on Truce today, and if you ever come up to Kansas City, I'd love to show it to you, but more importantly, it's what we can do with some older areas. It's a vision for the deuces, as an example, beyond, beyond the stadium that's gonna be developed. We're talking about down there in where the, um, the famous, uh, uh, what's the name of the, I just went out of, there, what's the name of the um, historic, the Manhattan Casino, and all around there, the intent to do housing. But to do that, you've got to create a stimulus of development and you've got to have ultimately beyond the city investing money, you have to have developers that are willing to take the risk. We were willing to take the risk, but, but we had to do it with these credits involved in, it, in the process. So we retained basically the old features of the Wonder Bread. We changed the signs. We found an old truck that we put up on the roof deck that I said that became a bar. It's used for the residents there as well as for others. We created a concierge lounge. Uh, we did a number of things to make it a popular place. And so that's an example of what the combination of the federal credits, but to get it going, we had to have those state credits. In Kansas City uh, and in Missouri and other states, you know, U.S. Bank has bought state credits nationally. I'm sure some of the local banks here would get more interested that are local Florida-based if they could purchase those credits because you know what? They're an ability to help wealthy individuals write off their taxes by buying those tax credits, which then you can conditionally throw back into the project itself. So that's kind of an example of how you repurpose, but you don't do it by just having um, a magic idea and say, okay, we'll try to do this. The shell dash could have worked, even more shell dashes in St. Petersburg can work when we have that state credit available. It will help preserve and make other developers an, an amount of dollars to put in place into the property. And even then, you've got to take risks. That's what development's about. So. This project, that's the roof deck that I talked about. It has the downtown views of Kansas City on the top, and there's been a lot of community events there. We have a, the Combine, who's the pizza restaurant there, has events upstairs, and it is amazing how active it is these days. People coming from all over the metro area of Kansas City there. And, and again, it's in an African-American area designated that now has become much more ability to integrate, if you will, and show how people can bring their resources together, how other people are willing to spend the money. Um, this is a, kind of some key highlights. This is an example of a one bedroom. They're large one bedrooms, and they're two bedrooms, and our rents now, I gotta, we started 
back then at $600, which was very affordable at the time. It's up to $650 now. But the point is that with the subsidies of other incentives, we're able to do that. Uh, we're able to, and, and the building stays virtually 100% full. It's 90% at that time, but literally today it's 100% full. And this is five years later. So, you know, you can make those properties, and what I call them is market rate affordable. You know, affordable, it means a lot of things to a lot of people, right? And future of Florida light tech in investment, low income tax credits mean different things to people. But you can do market rate with all these additional preserve and show that you can save preservation by using these kind of incentives that we're talking about today. Um, this also shows just some other things we have in it. We have an indoor parking space. There's a uh, protected area for cars. There's an outdoor surface area. There's, because parking in, indoor is very important to people, particularly in Missouri in the winter, not so much in Florida. But the outdoor patio entertainment areas in the winter, the pickleball ideas out in these back courtyards that I don't have a picture of right now. But all this is going on and very active. The next case study, that I want to talk to you about. So, so that Wonderlofts that I just talked to you about was basically a, a preserve project that Wonder Bread, Interstate Brands, had the presence of mind to put it on the market. We bought it, by the way, for a pretty unknown sum of 1.1.2 million, and we got them to lease it for a year while we were doing the. Uh, the whole approval process and we kept the wonder logos and the historic and we even took some of the old twinkie trays and put them on the building to make it cool and hip and and something that was fun so that's what you want to do you want to make these buildings fun which and these credits help you do that this building on case study two is so another quick story you see this sleet street car which is that Kansas City is one of the, that's why the delegation from St. Pete came up. They wanted to know about how we were doing streetcar. We took, you know, Kansas City had the second next to Chicago in New York, and third maybe in the 20s, had the best streetcar line in the country. And because of cars, they tore it out. And so guess what? Now, old is new. We're putting a free streetcar, which is acquire, which is basically using uh, state or federal money rather, through transportation grant, and it's also using a match through what we call a TDD, Transportation Development District. What it means is up and down the corridor, you self-tax people that are on the properties to get the streetcar going, and the streetcar's free. You know, the cost of it is subsidized through the property owners. But what it did was, for Kansas City, it's recreated a whole reju rejuvenation of some areas along Main Street. And maybe some of you have, I don't know if any of you watched the NFL draft or into football, most preservation people aren't, but hey, they had a huge thing at that Union Station. And, uh, and you know, the streetcar was a key element of keeping people moving. So we're building a new streetcar from where it stops at Union Station all the way to the Country Club Plaza, one of the oldest shopping, open shopping centers in the country, that'll be done in another year and a half. In the meantime, we, these opportunities for old buildings became available. So we were fortunate enough, again, because of historic tax credits, to buy three buildings along Main Street. These two this building here called the Netherland, that's what it was back in the days. It was a, basically a salesman hotel, and we converted it completely to 103 lofts uh, right here on Main Street. Uh, it would finished, we started it during, before COVID, during COVID, and it was basically, uh, you can see 121 units, seven commercial spaces. We had that entire project leased up within a year. And you know why? Because one, we kept those rents affordable. Two, we've learned a secret as a developer. You know, millennials love their dogs. I mean, we all love dogs, right? But millennials really love dogs. And the reason is we decided that we do no poundage limit. You could bring two dogs limit and your cats or whatever. And you know what? There was a building, a fancy new development up two blocks away that took them two years to lease it up to 100%. It took us six months because of the whole millennial appeal. 
And that's, but here's the beauty of that beyond that. We built those rooms, which were pretty old. I don't know if I have a picture right now of, uh, I don't have a picture in this rendering, but they were basically, the hotel was dilapidated as asbestos. The city was ready to condemn this after so many years. They were gonna condemn the hotel. We came in and convinced the other developer to sell it to us for about $800,000, which was nothing, because now it's worth over 50 million when in time gets, but the point is we were willing to take the risk, but the only reason that we could do it was historic tax credits. So here's what happened, I wanna tell you that story because it's a good, the, the developer who had it was awarded state historic tax credits and federal about 10 years ago. They could not, for many reasons, they just couldn't pull it off. The city got tired of waiting, they were gonna condemn it. We worked with the developer, the owner, and said, hey, if you will transfer your credit, your LLC, into our, and put our names into your LLC, we'll assume that. The reason why? Because then we were able to assume the tax credits that were sitting at the state of Missouri that would have been recaptured. So, but for recapturing those, we were able to capture, this is, uh, it was initially built as a, uh, old hotel apartments and we were able to put basically uh, to put 103 units into that uh, and create that value and we built those units they're small they're 500 to 600 square feet but they're set up almost like a hotel so the idea is that it's flex space when the when the streetcar finally comes in 25 there are interested flat hotels that would take that project buy, make it a flagship, perhaps buy it from us, although we're not necessarily interested in selling. That's another key point. We like to hold those credits. First of all, there's a requirement, FYI, if you do historic tax credits, that you have to hold them for a period of at least seven years. One, you're going back six years going forward, whatever way you want to mix it. But what I just explained to you, you could bring in new investors into your LLC on those tax credits to put new capital in. So that's why we're committed to staying in these projects for seven years. The first one I showed you, Wonder Lofts, this one, same deal. Why? Because we're helping build the tide. We're helping build it, and someday I'll take that money and bring it down to Florida <laughs> when you have the tax credit program. But, um, but that's the kind of effort that it takes. The building next to it, this building over here, we bought it at the same time. It's called the Monarch. It's an old warehouse that was from the 1920s, and we converted that to all residential. There's like three units per floor on each of those, um, and they're larger, and you know, some of the, so that's, and then we have the building next to it is a proposed, it's a parking lot for, our, you know, parking, even with streetcar, people have to have their cars. You know, we just, that's the way we are in America, right? But slowly it's starting to change with many of the millennials who are, you know, base there, they know they can be mobile and they can move and groove and go wherever. We've put in both these buildings a small amount of Airbnb. It's called Zen City through a group out of Chicago because we have a few, like six units that we like to have turn, you know, that we like to keep that way to bring new people in. Uh, but we try to mix them away from all the residential people. So, in other words, on the same, on a different floor. But what it allows us is that flexibility for the future. When streetcar comes, there's a lot of people have interest to come up and down that corridor. And the result of this streetcar, the, and it's not on this map, but if you went further, you see where in the background the skyline is? We bought another building that's very similar to this. It's called the ABC building. We're currently under, uh, just now, it took us two years to get the acquisition going, to get it historically approved through the SHPO, and uh, we've just now finally gotten that approval. We've gotten the city's approval. We'll start construction on that uh, later this year. But, and, and by the way, we have a couple banks that go along with us on these deals because one, we've proven that we can do it. Two, they like historic tax credits, which is what, again, we've got to educate Florida banks about what the value is to them. And they will, because they are value. They will not only help them grow their bank, but they help them attract new investment. So it does create new investment. 
And I didn't mention that, like you're talking about, Melissa, and retail on these strips. It creates retail because what we do is the mixed use. Everything below is retail and everything above is residential. It's, it, again, old is new, right? That's the way it used to be. You had Main Street, you had the people have their offices on, or their retail on the lower, and then on the top, they had their home. And in a little town of Boonville, Missouri, I did that. Took an old 1860 building, and we did exactly that. We reconditioned the upstairs apartment, and it's going great in a little rural town. So it's, it's a tool that can be used for, besides urban areas, rural areas, and community areas. It's just a matter of, of the community getting in partner with it. So uh, those are the kinds of projects we're doing. The last one I wanted, uh, oh, and the last one, um, this is a, up on the roof deck. Again, there's a roof deck up here. It's called the Canary. It's a restaurant that named after Amelia Earhart's first airplane. She was from, uh, from uh, a little town in Kansas nearby. And uh, so the, the restaurateurs decided to name it the Canary. And it's a, it has a roof deck skyline that looks all the way downtown skyline towards Kansas City. And this, this little adjacent is an alley that connects between the, the Monarch, which is the smaller building and the larger building. So those are just some of the things you can get creative with and that's why here in Florida as an example, our booths back there and I've hooked up with design styles out of Ebor because they have a really same story. They found a great old historic building that the city of Tampa was gonna tear down and they restored it for their architectural office and they reinvested. So Andy and his team um, have been great to work with and I realized you know we've got enough projects going with Caleb and my architect team in Kansas City that we needed to have a partner in in Tampa St. Pete so anyway the final one I wanted to talk about here's another and I wish I could show you the pictures of before this building was literally going to be condemned by the city it, it, it basically was dilapidated um, it was an old fur storage place and we were able to acquire this in a competitive process with the neighborhood, by the way, making the choice about five years ago. And we basically put 27 loft units in the building, put a roof deck up there on the top where those people are. And then inside there's a thing called the Kansas City Arts Warehouse, which is like here, St. Pete Warehouse, because art is cool. So they're there and it's been, again, it's in an area that's kind of in transition, but people are coming to it. And so those are the kind of projects that can be made possible where they were impossible because of the financing investment. And you know, I know Preserve the Berg has talked for a number of developers. I'm on the downtown partnership here in St. Pete. And you know, most developers want to do the high rise, fancy glitzy, want to bring in the money. Uh, that's fine, there's a place for that, but there's a place to also instill this historical character that makes St. Pete great. Just like we're trying to do the same thing in Kansas City, they're trying to do the same thing in St. Louis, but it's all these incentives that make that possible to make it happen. Uh, <clears throat> this project is 27 apartments, the five, I just told you about the art gallery. It's, to build it out was about eight and a half million. We got tax credits of about three million. We were able to put in two million of our own equity, and then the remaining was through uh, some private investors to make it happen. And so that's another building that stimulated an entire little area that was questionable. So those are the kinds of things I think that you can see. You know, so I, I love being in St. Pete. I live here, I live on the beach, St. Pete Beach, but I'm I spend as much time downtown St. Pete as I do on the beach. You know, it's it's because I'm an urban type guy, and uh, but you know, it's it's all about how what we vision can be possible. So that's why I think preserve the Berg, <clears throat> and I want to commend the Pinellas County for helping put this on because all of us know that to make a village rise, we've got to have 
the participation of all the elected officials, which we've been fortunate to have in St. Petersburg. We have to, in, uh, now coming around about affordable housing, but more importantly, how we have to mix that. Um, you know, the preserve the design build is working with some an outside developer on Mir Lake that wants to preserve the old school building there. Uh, I know those particular guys out of Minneapolis. They're good guys. They'll keep it historic and they'll also build it around it. So that's how you get these buildings to be preserved and developed in our community. So with that, Derek, you, you know, you did a great job of telling. Um, we're happy. Let's see what time is it now. We have. Uh, 202, we got a few minutes for questions. Yes, Manny. So Bob, Bob you and I have talked a lot uh, about putting these concepts. What has been the response in St. Pete? Uh, are you an outlier? Are you getting some traction? What is? Well, that's a good question. Thank you, Manny. Is that a loaded question? Um, so I, uh, no, I, I will tell you this. Um, and Derek's been great on his side. He, Derek was one of the first people I met with uh, talking about historic stuff, and he pretty much told me all the things you did. But really what I was looking for is what Melissa's talking about. I was looking for how can we make these things work financially. And that's been the you've presented to the downtown partnership, and that's a big question a lot of these developers. They keep coming in with these new projects, but wouldn't it be nice if they uh, could preserve some stuff and integrate it into that? Um, so the Shell Dash, which Councilwoman Gina Driscoll was a great champion to help us when we had, when we had that Shell Dash, the old historic one, and as, as this developer before your time, Manny, uh, unfortunately it expired and he agreed to be greedy and keep it. Um, but as Gina said, hey, you know, I like your concept. You're doing affordable. You've at least got, you're helping the, inner, the community over there. And so even though we don't have the cherry on the top of the building, I still want to support it. And the city did. So I, I want to commend that. Uh, Rob Gertis, who's the city administrator, was the um, housing administrator, stepped up right away with that. Uh, the council, we had to come back to them a couple times. They were supportive. Uh, they recognize the challenges, and the challenge on that is that we had to deliver these as new construction for $239,000 in a climate where even with subsidy, you can't do. So that's why on affordable housing, if we can couple it with these tax credits, we can maybe have a whole new toolbox to make these things happen, and then we can identify a lot more. We can have Derek help us. And he's very good. He's called me on a couple projects. Uh, the one I really would have rather had was that one on, on Central Avenue that, uh, that the guys, uh, the church. It was a great project, uh, Square Mouth or Square whatever they were, insurance company that have sold it since. But the, the projects like that are what help generate. Uh, and then we can bring these prices down. I mean, it's I, I'm just telling you as one, I can't afford to live in an $800,000 condo up on Central Avenue further up. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. We need to bring those prices down, but prices have gone up completely to 300 and some thousand just for materials combined with labor and getting them on time. And that's one of the big challenges in St. Pete as well in Tampa, as well as nationwide, how we get these things put together. So I think if we can get, and, and my final comment is in Tallahassee, you know, it's not a Republican or a Democrat issue. It's a, it's a community issue. It's about how we preserve the history of Florida because heaven knows we've done enough retail strip centers up and down the state. So let's preserve the downs like what Newport Ritchie's done, what Clearwater's trying to do in some of its areas in the, uh, in the Cleveland Avenue area. You know, all these areas can work and couple combined affordable with the right things. So I want to just back to your question. I think we still got ways to go with, uh, and I think Jason Mathis and his team at, uh, Nicole I know is here um, on his team. Uh, we've got an opportunity to really start talking about this value and the tax credit story, uh, I think will really help us maybe get over the goal line there. So, Melissa. Thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering on the Habitat for Humanity project you were talking about, was that going to be new construction or were they going to incorporate historic buildings? 
No, you know, the, the, it, it's going to be new construction, but what I was originally saying, we were going to move the shell dash, the original cottage, over there, and we couldn't, in, and, and Preserve the Berg had a grant to do that, but we couldn't get, so, so but the, that's another beauty. Um, developers need to be open to partnering, and we're partnering. We couldn't do the shell dash project without Habitat for Humanity, because they have resources that's not for profit that we don't have. And, as you know, the county's supporting them on several projects in Clearwater, Pinellas, all over, and St. Petersburg, and I think they're doing a great opportunity. So what we've done is basically put the design together and, and basically handing it off to them. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you talk about a project in smaller rural communities. Yes. Are the economics better there, or is it there uh, much difference in operating in that environment versus the urban environment? That's a good question. Uh, no, it's, it's different in the sense that you don't have as many uh, financial resources to provide that other than, um, you know, because they're usually strapped in smaller towns on their budget, whether it's the city or the county. Um, but what they can do is pigger, piggyback on these credits that Melissa and the other types of things that I'm talking about. Uh, for instance, they can do, like Derek said, easements. They can provide perhaps and convince some reutilization of some retail and allow the retail, by the way, to be captured as money to help pay for the building. So I think that's, that's a tool, but it, it's a little tougher. When I went to Little Mid-Missouri, named after Dan, Daniel Boone, um, you know, we had to work with the school district because they thought we were going to take money out of their pockets, which wasn't true. Uh, we were going to have to work with the, and they finally got the city to agree to put an easement grant and also to do a forgivable loan. So there is possible in smaller ways you can do that. And I don't want to forget the small projects. I mean, you know, the ones that Derek and what we've been talking about, the preservation of homes. Uh, that's another way on historic main streets to do that. So, yeah. So I think Maddie gave, thank you for that question he's given me, but Love, we're back here at that booth, and I'm going to be around the rest of the day. And I love the fact that you all are here to work on preservation. So thank you.